This is my eighth video on doing real analysis proofs. It's my sixth video on a, in a sub-series I'm calling Fundamental Inequalities. So far, the inequalities we've done have been fairly simple. This one, you can see, looks pretty complicated. It is going to have a longer, harder proof, and I think for time's sake, I want to just focus on some of the ideas of the proof uh, that you can then use to help you fill things in if you need to do it. It does involve a trick that would be hard to think of on your own, um, and so I am going to be mostly focused on that trick. Why am I doing this? Well, the last video we looked at the simplest form of the triangle inequality. I do want to fairly soon generalize that in a couple directions, one of which is to generalize it to higher dimensions. And the best way to get there, if I want to avoid trigonometry, which I do want to avoid trigonometry, is to prove this inequality. Um, I mostly hear people say it's called the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. You should definitely say Cauchy and not Couchy. Pretend you never heard that. That just hurts my ears. Cauchy. Here you can say Schwartz. If you're more uh, a German speaker, you might say Schwartz. Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, but I will, I'm will. i used to saying Cauchy-Schwartz, so I will say Cauchy-Schwartz, and I hope that doesn't bother you too much. All right, so we are. the statement is let n be a positive integer, a natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. And suppose you've got two n real numbers, a1 through an and b1 through bn. The main statement of the inequality is what you see here, the square of the sum of the products of the corresponding a's and b's, a1 times b1 plus a2 times b2 plus a3 times b3, etc., is less than or equal to the product of these two summations, the first of which is the sum of the ai squareds, and the second of which is the sum of the bi squareds. You can take the square root of both sides of this and write it in an equivalent form. The square root of something squared is the absolute value of that something, because that something could be negative, is less than or equal to this times this involving square roots. Although, by the way, if, if this is true, which it is, it's also going to be true that you can get rid of the absolute value signs and still get a true statement too because the thing inside could be negative, uh, whereas the product of these two things definitely can't be negative when we're dealing with the real number system here. Turns out equality occurs if and only if there is a constant c so that each ai is c times the corresponding bi for the same c for all i goes from 1 to m. Before I get into the idea of the proof, I want to remark that you can certainly think about this with vector notation. Let A be a vector. You know, in a book it would be bold-faced. Here, when you write it by hand, people often put a little arrow, or as I do, a half arrow above the vector to emphasize it's a vector. Let A be a vector whose components, or coordinates if you prefer, are A1 through An. Uh, physics, physicists are more likely to say components and mathematicians are more likely to say coordinates, but you can say either. Let A be that vector and let B be this vector of the same dimension whose coordinates or components are B1 through Bn. You may know, I hope you know, that this thing inside the absolute value signs there is A dotted with B not times, but you say dot, a dot b, the dot product, or inner product, standard inner product of a with b. There are non-standard ones, too. These things under the square roots, moreover, are lengths or magnitudes or norms of these vectors. This one is the length of a. I like using double absolute value signs there to emphasize it's a vector inside. Some people don't bother and just put single absolute value signs. And this thing is the length or magnitude or norm of b. And so this inequality with this notation would say the absolute value of the dot product of a and b is less than or equal to the length of a or norm of a times the norm of b. All those words are um, synonyms, length, magnitude, norm in this context. All right, so what is the idea of the proof? It takes kind of a a bit of experimenting to possibly be able to think of this for the first time. In fact, you know, it's enough of a trick that I could see it taking your typical student weeks or months or years to think of this trick if they continue to think about this inequality every day. You, you can certainly check this inequality for particular numbers, but of course that's not a proof. 
And again, I'm not giving the full proof, I'm just thinking about the idea of the proof. And the key trick is to consider the following function. Now, I'm not going to differentiate this function because I, I don't want to use derivatives, but it is a function that's going to turn out to be a quadratic, and I want to optimize the quadratic, it turns out, is the trick to helping you figure out the solution of this inequality, how to prove it, and again, we are going to avoid calculus. So f of x is going to be the sum, i goes from 1 to n, of what? Well, here's one way you can do it. ai minus x times bi quantity squared. I'm sort of motivated by this equation here when I think about this um, to help me think about the case of equality. Uh, that's partially why I'm doing it this way, though. That might not be clear how that's going to be helpful. I do want you to note, this is important, that since these squared numbers can't be negative, the summation also cannot be negative. We are dealing with the real number system here, no complex or imaginary numbers, so this quantity must be greater than or equal to zero, no matter what x is, for all x in R. All right, and that turns out to be an important observation. It also turns out to be important to recognize that as a function of x, this is a quadratic uh, function of x. At least, if at least one of those b's is non-zero, if at least one b, maybe called b sub j, for some j between one and n is non-zero. If all the b's were zero, this would not be a quadratic, it would be a constant function. Um, so let's, since we are just talking about the idea of the proof, let's imagine that that is the case. If you were doing a nice proof, you'd want to sort of separate into two, two cases. What if all the b's are zero? And what if at least one of the b's is non-zero? So um, you might want to know what the coefficients of that quadratic are. You can Go ahead and expand out this square. You can use FOIL, F-O-I-L, first times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, last times last. When you think of this as being multiplied by itself, first times first is AI times AI, it's AI squared. <clears throat> outside times outside and inside times inside both give you negative AI, BI times X, so we'd have two of those, negative two, AI, BI, X. And then the last times last is negative X, BI times itself. You have to square that. We get plus X squared, BI squared. And then by properties of summation, we can essentially distribute the summation sign through the parentheses. It's not really a distributive property, but that's, that's the form of it. And we can write this as the sum of the bi squareds times x, essentially factoring out the, excuse me, times x squared, essentially factoring out the x squared from the sum of these things. x squared is constant with respect to i. That's the coefficient of x squared, which since at least one bi is not zero, this thing is bigger than zero. It's a positive quantity here. Then we have the summation of this thing, which I can write as minus two times the summation of ai times bi times x. I can factor the x out. And then the constant term is going to come from this one plus summation i goes from one to n of ai squared. So the coefficient of x squared is this, which is positive. The coefficient of x is this uh, minus 2 times this, which could be a positive number. Um, and then the constant term is this. Let me give these things names. Let's call this capital A. How about this one? Without, let's do it without the minus sign included. Let's call that capital B. And let's call this capital C. If I make those definitions, then f of x can be written as ax squared minus bx plus c, where again, a is positive. Now, again, we are avoiding calculus. This is a function of x for fixed a's and b's. This is a function of x that you could graph. And since a is positive, it would be a parabola opening upward. 
and there would be a minimum value to it. It turns out finding that minimum value is the key to finishing the proof. But how would you find the minimum value without using calculus? Maybe you've done this before. You can complete the square. You can, I think it's best maybe to factor out an A out of the first two terms like this. And then you'd like what's here to be a perfect square. It's not a perfect square at the moment. How can you make it be? The trick is to take the coefficient of x, negative b over a, divide it by 2, and square it, and then just put it in there. Now, that's, that should seem wrong. How can you just put it in there? Well, you can do that as long as you compensate for that over here. We are really, by putting this in here like that, we are really adding a times this to this expression. So to compensate, I should subtract that. It's minus a times this. One of the a's cancels, and I'm left with b squared over 4a. This function is equal to this function of x. It's just a different form. The benefit is now this is a perfect square. It's x minus b over 2a quantity squared. And then again, I have this c minus b squared over 4a. Now think. There's your function of x that's quadratic with a positive coefficient for x squared. This graph is a parabola opening upward. It's got a minimum value somewhere. That minimum value occurs at the value of x where this is 0, right? Because if this is the smallest this can be is 0 when we're dealing with just real numbers. And the minimum value, so that minimum value occurs when x is b over 2a, and that minimum output occurs at c minus b squared over 4a. And since this function is always greater than or equal to 0, I can say that minimum value is greater than or equal to 0. This whole thing is greater than or equal to 0. That implies c minus b squared over 4a is greater than or equal to zero, which I am assuming is positive, so there's no problem dividing by zero there, if you were wondering, which would imply that uh, c is greater than or equal to b squared over 4a, and that would also imply a is positive, that b squared is less than or equal to uh, 4ac. Yeah would imply that. Now, why not go back and substitute these thing, things in for a, b, and c? I'm giving you a lot of details on this proof, even though it is still an idea of the proof. You should write things out in sentences. Proofs are arguments. You should write them up nicely in sentences. I'm not doing that here. and I, I know I didn't really do that in all my previous videos either, um, but when you write a proof, you should write it nicely given argument in complete sentences. So if I make those substitutions here, this thing squared is 4 times the summation. That's, that's b squared right there. 4 times a times c is 4 times this times this. We are basically done. You'd have to cancel the 4s. And that is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality right there. What about the equality occurring if and only if there's a constant c so that this is true? Well, if there is such a constant, then there would be a value of x where this equals 0. You could call that value c, where the graph touches the horizontal axis, the minimum value, the minimum output equals zero, and therefore this thing would be zero and these things would be equal, and that argument reverses itself too. So I will just say that verbally and let you just contemplate this and try to write things up nicely on your own.